You may have heard of a mathematical result called hairy ball theorem. It says, in non-technical terms, that there's no way to comb a ball covered in hair such that there isn't a calico part anywhere. The theorem is pretty famous, perhaps in part due to its memorable name, but I haven't yet seen a video explanation of why it's true that doesn't require too much background. I could tell you to go play around with a bushy sphere until you convince yourself that the theorem is true, or, if you keep watching, we can prove it. Our proof won't be too technical, but it will be helpful to quickly go over a more precise statement of the theorem. The Harry Ball theorem says that there doesn't exist an everywhere non-zero continuous vector field tangent to a sphere. Let's dissect what that means bit by bit. A vector is, for our purposes, just an arrow. It has a direction and a length. A vector field is when we put a vector at each point in some space. We call a vector field continuous if we can zoom in on any point some amount that makes all of the vectors in view look more or less the same, which wouldn't be the case if our vector field had a part. Tangent to a sphere means that the vectors are on a sphere pointing along the surface, as opposed to into or out of the sphere. Finally, everywhere on zero means that, well, none of our vectors have length zero, and there doesn't exist means, well, that there isn't one. Before jumping in, let's take a look at continuous vector fields on a simpler surface, a disk. We're going to be interested in the following measurement. If we were to face in the direction of the vectors on the edge of the disk as we walked around it, how many times would we spin around? For example, in this vector field, we walk around and we find that we go through one full turn. In this other field, we go through two turns. Let's call this measurement the winding number. Now, both of those examples have vectors of length zero. To use the hair analogy, a place where the hair stands on end. And in those places, the direction of the vector field suddenly changes. What can we say about the winding number if we know for sure that doesn't happen? Let's try a few examples. This one has winding number zero. This one, also zero. Another, zero again. Okay, it seems like we'll always get zero. How do we prove this? The key is that our vector field is continuous. This means that if we shrink the circle where we measure the winding number a little bit, the winding number shouldn't change, because the vector directions don't change enough during that tiny shrink to add or subtract a whole turn. We can keep doing this until our circle is so small that we know, again because of continuity, that all the vectors in it are facing in almost the same direction, in which case the winding number is definitely zero. But our winding number never changed during the shrinking, so it must have been zero to start with. All right, how does this help us conclude anything about a sphere? Let's start by examining a continuous vector field tangent to a sphere that's non-zero in at least one place. We can draw a circle on the sphere in an area where the vectors aren't zero. As before, if we make the circle small enough, all the vectors inside it will point in more or less the same direction. We can then flatten this area into a disk, and as we just discussed, its winding number must be zero. Here's the tricky part. We're going to stretch that small circle out until it takes up an entire hemisphere, and then we're going to flatten both hemispheres into disks, one on top of the other. If we follow the vectors during this flattening, we're going to see that they bounce off the equator as we go from the bottom disk to the top disk. Now, remember that the bottom disk's vectors are all pointing in more or less the same direction, so this bouncing tells us the directions of the vectors on the edge of the top disk. Let's find the winding number. As we walk around the circle, we go through one, two rotations. So the winding number is two. But hold on. We know from before that if the vector field is non-zero everywhere on the top disk, then the winding number would be zero. So there's a vector of length zero somewhere on the top hemisphere. Now, stretching the sphere needn't make any of our vectors that weren't previously zero suddenly become zero. So that means that somewhere outside the small circle we originally drew, there must have been a vector of length zero. This means that we can't have a vector field on the sphere, which is both continuous and everywhere non-zero, which is exactly Harry Ball theorem.